But what John of Patmos was talking about was not a prophecy for something that would happen in the future. Um, well, I mean, it was, but you know, look, it wasn't some detailed, you know, left behind style type no. prophecy of what will what will happen in the future. It's rather a story about what's going on in the present day with the persecution of the Christian church in the Roman Empire and how he is urging the followers of Jesus to continue to stay strong and remain followers of Jesus and remain faithful to the church because at some point the Roman Empire is going to is going to fall and the evil men who have been persecuting them will get their comeuppance. Yeah. Alright. So I'm actually going to start us with just the, um, well, here's how we're going to do this. So one of the questions that I had asked briefly is, um, we, we seem to be able to get through about two chapters of Revelations in a setting, which means that we could be in Revelations for like three or four more months. Uh, and I wanted to get the sense from people about whether or not we want to continue doing that or whether we want to just get through sort of this stuff that we've prepared. Um, and you're not mom. You don't smell like mom. No, I don't. I don't. That did not suit me. smell like mom. You're not mom at all. So, so I, I just kind of wanted to check in with everybody and see, do we want to do the entire book of Revelations two chapters at a time, or do we want to get to the point where, say, around chapter 16, 17, we feel comfortable enough with, we get what the book of Revelations is about, we have learned how to read apocalyptic literature and understand how these symbols and symbolic images work, and if you want to keep reading those last eight chapters or so, uh, nine chapters on your own, you can, but you feel comfortable doing it and it would make sense to you. Um, or do we want to just keep doing two chapters at a time until we're through it, which, uh, again, will probably take us the next three or four months to do that. I'm not a huge Revelations fan, so I would vote for continuing. But I would bless Wade Ruth. There's something about the lone voice crying in the wilderness. So I can't be that person. <laughs> right? I don't have a opinion anymore. Like you could just be repetitious. After a few more chapters. It, yeah, that, that's sort of what I was looking at. So you'll, um, that, that's sort of why I, I raised the question. Is I do think that it starts to get a little... Um, Repetitive, like you, you'll you'll figure out what you're reading right away once you've figured out everything that we've prepared study guides for. Um, so we just go to seventeen then, and then read the rest. Is that? I have not prepared study guides through seventeen. I prepared through sixteen. Okay. But seventeen, I think, is a really good stopping place because it's one last place where we get some behind the scenes. Uh, you know, there's the, those great scenes in, uh, in Matthew's Gospel and Mark's Gospel, right, where Jesus tells the parable, like the parable of the sower, right? You know, a man went out to sow, and some seed fell on the path, and some seed fell among thorns, and some seed fell into rocky soil, and some seed fell into good soil. And then later in the chapter, he takes his disciples aside, he's like, all right, now let me tell you what, you, know, you get the inside explanation of what just happened. Here's, here's what I meant when I said all that stuff. In chapter 17, we have the exact same thing, where basically instead of Jesus taking his disciples aside, an angel takes John of Patmos aside and says, let me explain to you some of these images, some of these symbols that you have seen in your vision. Um, I think it's a good place to stop because it's another good reminder of, I mean, a pretty clear what John of Patmos is talking about is Rome in Roman persecution of the Christian church in the first century. Um, I think the most conclusive evidence of that is to be found in chapter 13, but, um, but you'll get more of that. And um, yeah, like, like I said, you know, I mean, basically after that, we're, uh, we're wrapping up 
Uh, I think in chapter 18, maybe 19, we have a definitive defeating of the beasts and the dragons. And then it's just a whole lot of glory and praise, and God sets everything right. And, um, but again, like I said, I, I, my sense is that it starts to get a little repetitive, and um, more to the point, like, you'll, you, you, we've cracked the code, so to speak, right? We have talked about what all of these different images symbolize. We'll have sort of the big picture overview of what's what's going on in Revelation. Uh, you'd be at a point where I think part of the reason why so many people wanted to study Revelations was because it's a tricky book because of all those symbols, because of all the mythological imagery. Um, and I think that once we get through chapter 17, if you have the interest in continuing to read to the end of, of Revelations, you could do so in about an hour and and you would make pretty good sense of it all yourselves. You wouldn't need a Bible study group guiding you through it because you'll you'll know how these symbolic images work. And they're pretty much all symbols that, you, you know, there won't be anything new from that point on. You'll know what each of these things symbolize because we've already talked about it. So. <coughs> Revelations, I'm on it. The billboards make even less sense than the ad campaign itself does. I'm seeing these all over the place now. Like, I don't even know what that's supposed to be. Um, yeah, poorly done. Anyway, um, so is it, what, what do y'all think? Like, where's our? Yeah, that sounds good. We're, we're good. We're consensus. Well, so we'll get through what I prepared. I might not even prepare a study guide for 17 since it's just one chapter that I haven't done. And it is really very explanatory. You don't, almost don't need a study guide because chapter 17 almost is your study guide, right? Where it says this is what these things represent. Um, so it should be pretty, pretty obvious when you read about what we're going through. So let's jump in uh, to um, chapter 13. And you remember from last time we had this... Um, in chapter 12, we had this whole thing about a dragon who has um, um, found the woman who's pregnant with a child, tries to take the woman's child, but the child is taken up to heaven, so then goes after the woman, can't get the woman, so then goes after the, the, the church and you know, has a little bit of success there, but can't destroy the, the church as a whole, can just pick off individual believers here and there. So, right, so things are not, um, are not great. We're talking about persecution, you know, dragons harassing the woman, the Jesus, right, um, um, but is, is not able to win. So then, that same dragon, why don't we start on chapter 12, verse 18. Then the dragon took his stand on the sand of the seashore. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on its horn were ten diadems, and on its heads were blasphemous names. So it sounds a lot like the description we got of the dragon from chapter 12, right? Chapter 12, uh, verse 3, if you look, um, great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on its heads. Um, so we have this beast that is very similar. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And the dragon gave it its, he gave it his power and his throne and great authority. So the dragon is bestowing power and authority upon this beast that's coming up out of the sea. One of its heads seems to have received a death blow, but its mortal wound had been healed. In amazement, the whole earth followed the beast. They worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? Um, <clears throat> we'll keep going. The beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words. It was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. You remember from chapters 11, 12 from earlier, right, the significance of of that number, 42, um, that it's the, um, you know, the time of tribulation that's, uh, that's based on, uh, on prophecies in Daniel, right? Um, 
It opens its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. It was given authority over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all the inhabitants of the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written in the, from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb that was slaughtered. Let anyone who has an ear listen. If you are to be taken captive, into captivity you go. If you kill with the sword, with the sword you must be killed. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. That's a refrain you're going to hear again later. Here is a call for endurance and faith of the saints. Um, let's see. Okay, keep going. Then I saw another beast that rose out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast on its behalf, and it makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose mortal wound had been healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in the sight of all, and by the sight that it is, and by the signs that it is allowed to perform on behalf of the beast, it deceives the inhabitants of the earth telling them to make an image for the beast that had been wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast could even speak and cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell who does not have the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let anyone with understanding calculate the number of the beast, for its number is the number of a person. Its number is 666. So, thoughts about the chapter. Questions about the chapter. I'm going to spend a lot of time on that ending piece there starting at verse 18. But before we do, are there other things that we want to, to talk about or note? Yeah, that is correct. Uh, so that's... Um, yes, it was Nero who... Um, who first instigated the, the persecution of Christians as a matter of legal policy. Uh, Christians were not super popular uh, before Nero came along. You know, it was you know, like any minority group living in a majority culture, uh, there's probably some you know, nasty taunting and looking down noses at and stuff, but the kind of persecution, you know, the whole arresting and beating and killing and thrown to lions in gladiator pits, that sort of stuff, that's Nero who gets that going. Um, so when we talk about Nero, um, one, there's, there's a couple of theories about the, one of its heads, this is verse 3, Chapter 13, verse 3. One of its heads seems to have received a mortal death blow, but its mortal wound had been healed. Uh, there's a couple of different conjectures about what that might mean. One is the assassination of Julius Caesar, you know, when the, when the emperor is killed, and yet the empire is able to, to persist. You know, a new emperor is able to, um, a short time thereafter, rise up and, and replace Julius Caesar. Uh, another would be Nero, uh, because Nero was, I mean, really crazy, really crazy guy. Um, so Nero killed himself and believed and told others that after killing himself, he was going to come back from the dead. Um, this guy was like, you know, we, we've already talked about this whole, if Jesus is Lord, Caesar is not about how many um, Roman emperors used the, uh, the title Son of God for, them, for themselves. Uh, so like there's this clear contrast with Jesus, right? The whole um, uh, 
triumphal entry with palm branches, how that was uh, Jesus recreating what an emperor would do when he comes to a city. Right? This sort of like juxtaposition that the Christian church, starting with Jesus, did where they're taking and subverting a lot of the emperor's own desires to be seen as divine. Right? If you were a good Roman citizen, you were expected to worship the emperor as a divine being, as the son of God, as somebody who had godlike power within him. For most of the Roman emperors, that was more a matter of narcissism and pride and just wanting to be told that they were really, really great. Nero seems to have legitimately believed that he had supernatural powers and that if he killed himself he would come back from the dead like he was he was not right in the head um and this way says you know, that, uh, mortal wound uh, this why it says in greek it's the plague of its death so it's it escaped the plague of its death so which in fact basically reads a little bit easier than he came back alive mm. <laughs> right, right. Um, so um, there's a couple of ways we can look at that, but Nero is definitely one that people look at because there was there was like a legitimate like cult of this guy who really believed that he was going to come back from the dead after killing himself. Like there were actually there there was a cult around this guy because um, he was just not right in the head. <laughs> um, other questions, comments, thoughts? I did point out as we were reading through there that thing about um, here's a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. That's a major motif in Revelation, right? In fact, I think that word for word is going to appear later in the chat, uh, later in the book, again. Right? But again, that's a major theme of the book of Revelations. You are facing persecution endure the persecution that you are facing. <coughs> and that's sort of the, the warning there for those people, right? If you're taking Christians captive, someday you're going to go into captivity yourself. If you kill with the sword, someday with the sword you're going to be killed. That's, and that's the other major theme of Revelations, right? It's this sort of juxtaposition, this sort of reversal of fortune. Where right now the Christian church is being persecuted and oppressed and just all kinds of violence done upon it. But the promise of Revelation is that before too long God is going to show up and turn the tables and going to be inflicting violence upon those who have inflicted violence upon God's church. Um. Any other things about chapter 13 that you all want to talk about? Because otherwise I'm going to start talking about this whole 666 thing. Okay, I'm going to talk about the 666 thing. First of all, I also want to know who has a footnote at the end of that last verse. Who has a footnote on their Bible? Raise your hand if you have a little footnote at the end of that last verse that says the number of the beast is 666. Okay, what does your footnote say, Mary? Mine says the number of the beast, 666, is to be discerned by a form of spiritual calculation. It likely suggests the Roman Empire Nero, the numerical value of whose name transliterated into Hebrew is 666, who, one might say, sat for the portrait of the beast, but who is now dead. The beast is like Nero, but cannot simply be identified with. Okay. What do you got for a photo? His number is 666. Somehow unknown to us, this number will play an important part in the identification of the Antichrist in the future day. What do you got for a footnote? I didn't have one, I think. Joe, what do you got for a footnote? Because of the many possibilities of the identification of the beast, the most likely is Nero Caesar. The numerical total in Hebrew is 666. Nero had been the first member to persecute the church. Okay, so lots of people are pointing us to Nero. Does anybody have the footnote that says other ancient authorities read? Nobody has a footnote that says other ancient authorities read? Oh. It says other ancient authorities read. 
616. There we go. That's what I was trying to say. I would say mine says some manuscripts 616. Some man or that works too. Some manuscripts say 616. This to me is the most conclusive evidence that we have that what we are talking about is not some future antichrist, but about the historic person, Nero. And here's why. Because, as Mary and Joe's notes correctly point out, in the Hebrew alphabet, every letter has a numerical value. And so, if you take the name of Nero Caesar in Greek, and you translate that into Hebrew, and then you take the numerical value of all of those Hebrew letters, and you add them up, you will get 666. But, note, some ancient manuscripts say 616. If you take the name Nero Caesar in Latin, then translate it to Hebrew and add it up, what do you think you get? 616. That is by far the most plausible explanation why many of the ancient manuscripts, most of the ancient manuscripts, say 666, but why a significant number of them instead say 616. Because if you go from Greek Nero Caesar to Hebrew, you get 666. If you go from Latin Nero Caesar, you get 616. And that's why I think this is your best piece of, I mean, that's the, the only thing that really makes sense. Why would some ancient manuscripts say 616 instead of 666? Well, there's a really plausible explanation, is they took the same word, but they started with the Latin version of it instead of the Greek version of it. And so they arrived at a slightly different Hebrew, Hebrew transliteration numerology. Um, that to me, like I said, is, is the most definitive evidence that when we talk about 666 and this whole who is the beast, who is, is that that to me is the most definitive piece of evidence that we have that what John Patmos is talking about in the book of Revelations is not some sort of far off future prediction of a left behind type scenario of a one world government and a major battle taking place in the Middle East and all of those sort of ways that these symbols get translated. What he is talking about is he is talking in code about the persecution of the Christian church that is happening in his day by the Roman Empire that began with Nero, who was by far the, the worst and nastiest of the emperors to, um, to persecute the Christian church. Now again, I just want to reiterate that just because I think John of Patmos is talking specifically about the circumstances in which he lived, that doesn't make this book irrelevant to us, right? Like empires that persecute arise throughout history. The Roman Empire was not the first, nor was it the last. And so this idea that, that Revelations is getting at, that in the face of persecution especially, it is important that you continue to be a witness to your faith to be a vocal witness, right? I mean, that's the whole point. How, how do you escape persecution in the Roman Empire? We just, Christian, no, 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 right? That's an easy way to get, get out of it. You just deny your faith, you deny Jesus, you deny your, your, your religion. Uh, whether you actually leave the Christian faith or just pretend you're not a Christian, either of those things will pretty well get you out of the persecution. But that's what the whole point of Revelations is, is John Patmos saying to the church, continue to be faithful witnesses to Jesus Christ, even though witnessing to Jesus Christ is going to make life harder for you. In a very real, tangible, often violent way, continue to be faithful followers of Jesus. Continue to witness to Jesus. Right? Continue to spread the good news of the gospel in a world where spreading the good news of the gospel is dangerous, where, the, where you are the minority view, 
where we're saying what what Jesus said can get you in trouble. Um, so kind of like a big pep talk. Exactly. That's and and so then that's where the apocalyptic imagery comes in so handy, right? Because yes, you're getting persecuted now. Yes, you're you're being taken off to the slaughter. Some of you are dying by the sword, but just you wait. Because before too long, God's going to show up and God's going to crack some heads and, and, and you are going to get through this. And sure enough, right, while it might not be this sort of apocalyptic, you know, stars falling from skies and rivers turning to blood, where is the Roman Empire now? And where is the Christian church? Right? I mean, John's, John's call to persevere is not, is, is not wrong. Is like, you will indeed outlast the evil that you are facing. Uh, it might not have been in sort of the, the grand apocalyptic way that it's laid out here, you know, with, as we'll get to here in a little bit, the seven flaming bowls of wrath <laughs> poured out on people. It might not be quite that dramatic. Um, but you also may guess at some time that <clears throat> Nero Caesar was not of uh, John's time. Right, so Nero Caesar is gone by the time. Is that everybody? Domitian? Domitian? I'm not sure who he was. the Caesar at the time, which was called, they called the Nero Revive. Mm. Uh, you know, going back to that cult. Of, oh, right, right, so the resurrection. The current, in John's time, the Caesar in John's time was believed to be Nero, mm -hmm. reincarnated. Well, and that's why Nero is such a great stand, right? He, like, he's the arch villain, but even Nero at this point is symbolic for just the cruel emperors of Rome, right? Nero makes a great stand in because he was the most, <laughs> you know, like if, if, you want a, if you want a villain to represent all of the emperors, Nero makes a great one. Uh, because he was the one who really started the persecution, the violent persecution of the Christian church as a matter of a legal policy. Um, but yeah, he's he's gone by the time this book is being written. But he's the he's the stand-in, right? He's the guy that we can point to and and say Nero. And what was it that you said, Mary? Something in your footnote about. Mm -hmm identifies with Nero, but not exclusively Nero, or something like that? No, yeah. So he's at the part for the beast, but who is now dead. The beast is like Nero, but cannot simply be identified with. Right. Cannot simply be identified, because Nero's gone by the time John's writing this book. But Nero, right, like, um, not, not unlike the way that you might compare tyrants today, dictators today, to, you know, Hitler and Pol Pot and Stalin. They, they've just, they, they've almost and the become... the archetype. Right, the archetype. I like that word. Um, yeah. Um, so like I said, this, uh, I, 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 we'll, we'll move on to the new stuff here, chapter 14 going forward, but like I said, this to me was the, uh, is, is sort of the definitive piece of evidence that what we're talking about is the Roman Empire as it's persecuting the Christian church. Because Nero Caesar is the only thing that makes sense when the number of the beast is usually 666, but can also be 616. Because if you go Greek to Hebrew, you get 666. If you go Latin to Hebrew, you get 616 when you're doing, doing Nero Caesar. And we have most of our ancient manuscripts say 666, but there is a significant number of them that say 616 instead. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, but I wanted to spend a little bit of time on that because, you know, that's, that's one of the really important things that we've talked about several times throughout this Bible study, you know, is what is the perspective that you bring to Revelations? Um, I think that Revelations is written primarily about the events that John of Patmos is experiencing, the Christian church is experiencing at the time of its writing, rather than something that's going to happen 2,000 or 3,000 or 4,000 years from now. But again, I... I Put that little plug in that, that also it continues to be relevant today because empire and oppression and those that rule through military might you know these things 
how are you going to win this? And they, the Romans were not the first to do it, and they were not the last to do it. Uh, I also, as we jump into chapter 14, I, I put in the introductory remarks up there. Um, the importance of the continuity, like we're going to have the 144,000 that we already talked about, we got the special seal from God, so they were not tormented by some of those woes that came earlier. Um, the, the four living creatures keep showing up, the 24 elders keep showing up. Um, lots of these images keep showing up throughout the book of Revelations. And because of that, as I put there, Revelations is generally not a good book to read passages out of context. <laughs> if you really want to understand the book of Revelations, you really kind of do need to read it from beginning to end in its entirety. Because if we were to just talk right now, like if, if, if you had not read anything before chapter 14, and we start talking about the 144,000 and the four living creatures and the elders, and you're like, what the heck is going on here? Doesn't what the time to say that in the great at the beginning? What? Doesn't it instruct him to read it from one end to the other? Oh. <coughs> Why is that sticking in my hand? I think it's I think it's wise not to read passages from Revelations out of context because they are a little little bit crazy even when you read the whole thing from beginning to end. So, um, so how was this book disseminated and how did it as one whole piece? I mean, you know, Paul it's letters, but this was recorded as one full piece that. Pieces in Probably the very similarly to Paul in the letters. You know, John, we are, are told that John is in exile, mm -hmm. so he can't go to the Christian churches, so this is a pretty good solution for him, is to write this coded message that he gets to send. And I, I know we talked about that before, right? Like, one of the advantages of apocalyptic literature is you can write your code, mm -hmm. right? And, and so that's why we have, I mean, you have these little caveats, right? This calls for wisdom, it says in verse 18. This calls for wisdom. Let anyone with understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a person. Its number is 666. I mean, that's pretty explicitly saying, by the way, here's a coded message. I mean, it, I'm thinking of like that, um, uh, that, that Christmas story, right? Like, get out your little orphan Annie decoder rings and, and decode this message, right? Um, it's a pretty explicit, like, all right, kids, get out your decoder rings, and here's here's the code message. I thought that's what nursery rhymes were too. I heard that they were. Yeah, a lot of nursery rhymes are are, are based on yeah, and, yeah, based on historical yeah. historical stuff. Slime and the rulers. Yeah, my favorite. So yeah, I mean, that's that's John said at least one copy of this to at least one major church and mm -hmm. may have produced more than one copy. Um, we don't know a whole lot about John of Patmos beyond what's written here in this book itself. Um, so whether this man was, was literate himself or whether he had a scribe writing this down for him, it's not immediately clear. Um, I'm inclined to think he was probably literate just because this is a Kind of a work of art, you know. I mean, this is very good. I mean, this is what I'm writing down. Right, right. This is really poetic stuff, and I can't imagine being the scribe if somebody's dictating this to you orally. Oh, the scribe is in the first. Right. You're like, John, you want to rethink that section? <laughs> you, you want what? What? What's How this about? How many heads this time? <laughs> um, I mean, it, and, and because, right, so this is this is another reason why I think is that John was probably literate and wrote this himself by hand. This shows, one, 
a very good knowledge of Scripture, particularly the apocalyptic and prophetic pieces of the Older Testament. I mean, you just about every week we have pointed back to, oh, here he's basically quoting from Daniel, or here he's basically quoting from Joel, or here he's basically quoting, right? Um, <clears throat> so this guy clearly knows the Bible itself. He knows the scriptures, right? He knows the Old Testament, which is the scriptures at this point. We don't have a canonical New Testament when John is writing, but he is familiar with the scriptures insofar as the scriptures are the Older Testament, the Hebrew Bible. He's also clearly very acquainted with apocalyptic literature as a genre, right? Sort of in the same way that you have to read a whole lot of poetry before you get good at writing poetry. You have to read a lot of detective novels before you get good at writing detective novels, right? When there is a genre that has its own particular tropes and formulas and ways of, of unfolding, you have to be pretty familiar with that genre to do it well. Um, but when you read the New Testament, don't you find it just, you know, going back to our, our uh, dinner church discussion, I don't you know if people are involved in it, but you know, they're the only, the oral Torah and the written Torah. Mm. That was the only books that these guys had. That, that, that was the, essentially the Bible. Right. Um, how it just amazes me how well versed they were in it. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, all the New Testament, New Testament is yes. versed in what that yeah. the oral and written, and they were different Torahs. They were different. Absolutely, absolutely. Like I mean, you're right. Like all, all of the you know. All of the Old Testament, I mean, Paul, you know, in his letters frequently refers back to the Older Testament. Um, the Gospel writers frequently refer back to the Older Testament, specifically the prophets, where they might think the prophecy here or there points to Jesus, right? Like there's... I mean, they're studying yeah. something incredible. <laughs> um, yeah. Or, and, yeah, you know, it was a way of life. I mean, that was, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that was... Uh, I'm a really big fan of, of Judaism in how it handles the text. Uh, I, I often find myself wishing that the Christian church was more Jewish in its approach to the text. So don't read it, Marty, but... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, the, the, um, there is certainly a big push in... Well, one of the things, you know, I listen to a lot of Christian radio, and one of the things that I hear a lot is the biblical worldview, that phrase, the biblical worldview, um, which is just so foreign to how uh, our, our ancestors in the faith approached the, the scriptures. Uh, it was very much, it wasn't like a, here is the Bible, here is the one and only way to interpret it, it is a black and white manual for how to live your life. Rather, it was like, here is this uh, collection of stories, and it is our job to figure out what they mean and to debate them. You know, there's a, uh, I mean, this sounds almost sarcastic. It almost sounds like a joke, but this is actually a thing that rabbis have said on the record where they say the best interpretation of the text is the one that allows for the most interpretations of the text. Um, I think that when we get into this mindset that the Bible is just this black and white how-to manual uh, that is the, the, you know, there's only one way to interpret it, and that one way is authoritative for our lives. That actually makes us paradoxically really lazy about reading it and applying it as a manual to our lives. <laughs> you know, I mean, you would think that if somebody were, were espousing that view, that, that they would take it much more seriously. But I find that most of the people who, who have that view of the Bible, that it's this black and white manual of how to approach the Bible, actually have read surprisingly little of the Bible. Um, <laughs> how do you read it, though? How do you read your faith? Right? I mean, how do you... If you read it as being one thing, from beginning to end, and unchanging, how, how do you grow as you age? I mean, <laughs> And well, to not I realize that it is also a document of a time and place. 
you know, so but there are so many of the these. Time and place. <laughs> and, yeah, but there's so many things we read that we're applying all these very um, metaphorical meaning. Mm -hmm. You know, on this rock I will build my church. They're standing in a specific place that is a very heathen place, you know, so there's kind of this dual meaning and as modern Americans, <coughs> we kind of read it in a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I mean, I think that's all good, good stuff for us to. We went to Israel in the year 2000, and we were on a tour, and our tour leader was a secular Jew, and when they were talking about the Torah, the Orthodox, the very Orthodox, they are state-supported studying the Torah, and this guy was our. He never said it out loud, but you could, were obviously, he was. Definitely implying, yeah, I'm this poor working stiff while I'm supporting that guy who's spending all his time studying the Torah. So, you know, the people who are immersed in study aren't also out in the real world applying this. You know, we're, we're looking at every period, every article in here mm -hmm. to figure out these deep meanings. Um, so, we'll jump into chapter 14. Somebody want to read through verse 13, stopping at verse 14. Then I looked and there was the Lamb, standing on, the Mount, standing on Mount Zion, and with him the 144,000 who had his name who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was the sound of the harpist playing on their harps, and they and they singing a new and they singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is those who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins, those who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They have not been redeemed from humankind as the first fruits of God and the Lamb. They have been redeemed from humankind as the first fruits of God and the Lamb. And in their mouths no lie was, was found as they are blameless. I'm already going to stop you there. Because we, um, one of the things we talked about when the 144,000 first came up was that this is probably a symbolic number. Um, you know, that there are, the 12 is really significant. You got the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles, which Jesus was intentional about picking 12 apostles to represent the 12 tribes. Right, 12 is sort of that number of completion, right, the whole people. So we talked about that when that first came up, is that 144,000 is 12 times 12. That's the significance of the number. So it really represents a complete completion, right, the whole people of God. We talked about how that was a symbolic number and not a literal number, even though there are a few people who might tell you that it's a literal number. Here's a really good example of why we can know this is uh Symbolic, because if we are to take this literally, all 144,000 are yeah. men, because they are all virgins who have not known a woman, right? Um, so, if, if we are to take this literally, the, all the saved are are men. <laughs> Sorry, ladies. Um, uh, I don't. I, again, I don't think this is meant to be taken literally. It's a symbolic number representing the whole people of God. Here, even virginity, right, is not a literal requirement of your salvation. Virginity represents purity, right? Um, in their mouth, no lie was found. Everybody was told a half-truth at some point in their lives. Um, this, is a, this is a symbolic, these are the people who were, who were faithful and loyal to the church of God. These are the people of God, right? The whole people of God, the entirety of the people of God who have been saved. Um, somebody want to read from there to the end of verse 13. 
Then I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. He said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Then another angel, a second followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then another angel, a third, followed them, crying with a loud voice, Those who worship the beast and its image and receive a mark on their forehead or on their hands, they will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured unmixed into the cup of his anger, and they will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torments goes up forever and ever. There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image and for anyone who receives the mark of its name. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and hold fast to the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this. Blessed are the dead who from now on die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. All right. So, we have this sort of parallel. You remember the last time some showed up in mid heaven, there was uh, the announcement of the three woes. Here we have three angels making announcements. Um, and you'll notice that we've had this kind of a significant shift that happened in our perspective at the start of chapter 14, where the focus in chapter 13 was on these beasts, dragons and beasts, and their tormenting of the, uh, the, the church. Here we have the shift focusing to, to God, to, you know, first to the Lamb, then to the angels, and the... I, I got this really cool image in my head. Would you mind buy a bottle of wine that was called um, the wrath of fornication? <laughs> it like that? Sounds like quite a party. Yeah, so which modern wine? <laughs> wrath of fornication. <laughs> I, I would just, I, somewhere I want to see a wine bottle that has on the front label wrath of fornication um, and maybe some image of the beast on there or something. That would be... I would get a kick out of that. Um, when we talked about numbers, I can't remember. Have we, have we talked about the fact that there's seven beatitudes in Revelation? Yes, we did talk about that the first time that the blessings okay. came up. I don't know that I have. I don't think I've done a good job as we've gone through of numbering them as they're coming up. But we did talk about that at some point well, in one of the old study guides. Uh, yes. So uh, Joe is pointing out. Verse 13, blessed are the dead who from now on die in the Lord. Uh, so you, you all know, hopefully, that phrase, beatitude. If you don't know the term beatitude, it, it usually refers to um, in the fifth chapter of Matthew's gospel where Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who mourn for the earth. Right? Um, so a beatitude is just a fancy church word for blessing. Um, and we often refer to those parts of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is saying, blessed are those, you know, blessed are the meek, blessed are the peacemakers. Um, those are the Beatitudes, but we, um, in Revelations, there are seven Beatitudes. There are seven places where it says, blessed are blank, right? Blessed, and here it's, blessed are the dead who from now on die in the Lord. Um, I know we did come up. We covered that some earlier study guide when they first started coming up. But seven. This is number seven? No, I said again, it's seven of them. Oh, yes, there are seven of them. I wasn't sure where we were, but I have not been. No, this is two. <coughs> this is just number two? Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, maybe that's why I haven't been doing a good job keeping track of it. All right. Um, seven Beatitudes in the Book of Revelations. Blessings on those who have done blank. Um, yes, so good. That's one of the attitudes. Um, again, you have this almost word for word thing, right? Um, back in chapter 13, verse 10, here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. In chapter 14, verse 12, here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and hold fast the faith of Jesus. You noticing the theme here? Right? This whole like, this whole premise of in the face of persecution. Don't back down. 
right? Don't stop telling the world about Jesus just because you got crazy psychopath emperors who might go after you if you do. It is a call. Like, if, if you were to ask me what is the book of Revelations, and I was allowed to give you one sentence, I would say, here is a call for the endurance of the saints. That's what Revelations, at its heart, is all about. A call for the endurance of the saints. Um, and it's kind of interesting. It's still, but I'm not, I'm not going to put myself in the first century Christian level of persecution, but I, I'll tell you right now, I put a quote on the Facebook page. It's just a quote. It's just from Jesus of Nazareth. I said, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Jesus of Nazareth. So I put it. It's actually something Jesus said. You'd be amazed how pissed off people got when I put that on my Facebook page. So I, just, I just put a quote from Jesus up there. <laughs> That's all I did. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Jesus of Nazareth. So people got really deeply so offended. Why were they mad about that? Because it was, it was, viewed, it was, viewed, as, it was viewed as anti military, mm -hmm. as anti US government. Anti-military mostly was the problem. Um, so that's problem with the tell you. That's what Jesus said, people. It's not coming for me. Um, but yeah, you know, um, here's a call for the endurance of the saints. A lot of the things that Jesus taught are not super popular in the middle of the empire. So there we go. Anything else about this that we want to talk about? Babylon's getting fallen. Followers of the beast are getting punished. That's basically the messages of the three angels, right? Message number one, worship God, fear God, obey God alone. Message number two, oh, by the way, we're taking down Babylon, which we've covered already is a pretty good stand-in for Rome, right? Because Babylon was the empire of the Old Testament. They, they were, <laughs> right, getting back to that thing we said how many times, right, Rome was not the first empire, nor will it be the last. Um, Babylon makes a really good stand-in for, uh, for empire, and that's, that's also a motif that you get in the Old Testament, even outside of apocalyptic literature, um, that not every time do the prophets talk about Babylon do they mean Babylon. Like, Babylon's also a great stand-in for those... The empires, right? The people that will come and with the sword and with threats of violence will oppress and enslave others. Um, so Babylon's fallen, and then the message of the third angel is basically, you know, oh, and all the, the people who followed Babylon, who followed the, the beast and the dragon, they're, they're going to get their comeuppance, too. Um, <clears throat> somebody want to read the last bit of the chapter? We're going to have two harvests. The happy harvest and the angry harvest. Okay, the harvest of the earth. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And seated on a cloud like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head, and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling out with a loud voice to whom, to him who sat on the cloud. Put in Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the clouds swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too with a sharp sickle. And then another angel came out of the altar, from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire and his, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, and its grapes are, for its grapes are red. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the great harvest of the earth and threw it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. This is how we get the wine of wrath. Not the wine of fornication. Not the wine of the wrath of fornication. This is just the wine of wrath. There's no fornication. It's, the wine. it's a different vintage. This is just the wine of wrath. Not the wine of the wrath of fornication. 
<laughs> so I hope to you all. Okay, and then the, and the wine press was hot outside the city, and the blood flowed from the wine press as high as the horse's bridle for 1,600 stradia. Stadia? Stadia. I don't know what you Is it Stadia? Stadia. Yeah, which is a unit of, of measurement. Um, just About 184 miles. Yeah, maybe just two miles. Or, mm -hmm. or about 607 feet. Stadia is an old Stadia. unit of measure of distance in the Roman Empire. Pretty, pretty 184 pretty is probably the closer. Graphic yeah. yeah, so we have the happy harvest, right? The one coming, like, so who is the one coming on a cloud like a son of man? Jesus! There we go. See, we're getting really good at this whole symbolism thing. And that, remember, uh, the whole image of the son of man comes from Daniel. Uh, hopefully you'll remember that from when we did that earlier. Is that chapter 7 of Daniel, I think? Uh, but um, that's, that's where that whole image of the Son of Man comes from, one like a Son of Man. Um, and there's the happy harvest, right? Jesus gathers all the grain into his barn. Jesus is gathering up all the righteous people, right? That's the happy harvest, the harvest of the grain. Jesus is gathering the, the righteous people into his little community, his kingdom, his zone. <coughs> and then we have the angry harvest. We need to get some grapes. And the reason that we need to get grapes is because we need to make some wine of the wrath of God. And we press these grapes to make the wine of the wrath of God, and it comes out as blood, flowing as high as a horse's bridle for 200 miles. That's, I mean, that makes the scene in The Shining with the elevator doors open up, that's like a cakewalk at that point, right? This is way more blood than that. Way more blood than that. Um, yeah, so we have the happy harvest of the righteous being gathered up by Jesus, and we have the angry harvest in which this angel is making the wine of the wrath of God and pouring out wrath on the earth. Um, so we're going to do verse 15, uh, chapter 15. I'm going to nail this real quick because this is a quick one, and then we get 16. We're going to actually be like, getting through some stuff. We're on a good pace. Then I saw another portent in heaven. Great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last. For with them, the wrath of God is ended. So already we're hearing, we're wrapping this thing up, people. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps in their hands. So these are who? Who are these people? Who are these people who have conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name? Right, which again is the whole why you read everything in context when we're referring back down to chapter 13. The redeemed. The, not just the redeemed. I mean, yes, it's the redeemed, but it is, right? If I, like I said, if I were going, what's that? Like the people that are following God. Following God. Endurance. In endurance, exactly. In the midst of persecution, right? They are the ones who have continued following God despite the persecution. Like I said, if I had one sentence to sum up the book of Revelations, here is a call for the endurance of the saints. These are the people who endured because they are the ones who overcame the beast and its image and the number of its name. These are the ones who, despite the persecution, were able to remain true and faithful to Jesus Christ. Right? They endured. And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and amazing are your deeds, Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Lord, who will not fear and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your judgments have been revealed. After this I looked, and the temple of the tent of the wilderness in heaven was opened. And that sort of refers back to, you remember Joe brought this up the last time there was a thing about the temple in heaven, this whole parallelism between there's a temple in heaven and a temple 
on the earth. There's a parallel between what's going on in the heaven and the earth. Right? So this is the earthly, or the, sorry, excuse me, the, the heavenly temple, the heavenly tabernacle, which is a reflection of the earthly tabernacle. And out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues, robed in pure bright linen, with golden sashes around their chests. At least they look cheery before they get going. Then one of the four living creatures, right, there's those four living creatures that represent all life on, on earth, uh, gave the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were ended. So we're getting this sort of mirror imagery, right? You remember how the Holy of Holies, the inner part of the temple, nobody could go in there except for the, the appointed priest, and he went in there to anoint, to burn incense at the anointed time. Here you have sort of that same imagery of smoke filling that tabernacle, and nobody else is allowed in until these seven angels are able to pour out their seven bowls of the wrath of God, right? So it was made in the wine press, last chapter, and now it's made in... Um, and now it's poured into these bowls, and it's going to get poured out onto the earth. So this is um, a fairly straightforward chapter, I think, right? This is sort of pro providing our transition <coughs> into what comes next. When the seven bowls are poured out upon the dragon and the beast, and the second beast and all their followers, those with the 666 on their foreheads, the people, who gleefully participated in the empire, they're going to get their comeuppance. Um, anything else I want to say about chapter 15? I don't think so. Just again, right, like the importance of endurance, right? The, the redeemed are not just the redeemed, they're the ones who endured. They endured the, the beast and it's number. Okay, we're going to do this. We're going to get through this whole darn thing. We could be done tonight if we wanted to. I mean, we don't necessarily have to read through 17. I don't know, what's everybody think? Do you want to finish here at 6.30 and do 16 and 17? Do one more in Revelation? Do we want to do 16 tonight and just be done? What are your thoughts? I don't think it makes sense to do just chapter 17 by itself. So we could end with our one hour of time and do 16 and 17 next time and then be done? Or we could just read 16 right now and be done. We'll do it like we do at kids' time. Please raise your hand if you yeah, want to read 16 I, I now 17 and be done. Because one, time, one summer in Lennox, the preacher went on on about Revelation. And he had a lot of fun with chapter 17, which is cringe. I want to hear what you do with 17. <laughs> okay, I hope it's not cringe Okay, so let's 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 call this our hour, which is what we're shooting for anyway. And next time we will do 16 and 17, and then we'll just be done with Revelations. I, I think that was sort of the consensus. Uh, once once you're through 17, it really does start to get a little bit um, be redundant, and the things make. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it really is. It's it's the whole, it's done, we won, we, we have uh, conquered Rome, Babylon, beast, dragon, whore, whatever, whatever metaphor you want to use, they're all kind of the same thing. Yeah, I'm just glancing at chapter 18. There's more of the line of the wrath of fornication. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of wine that's so good for you. I'm telling you, I would buy that wine just to have that bottle sitting on I, I don't even know if I would drink it. it would just, and maybe I wouldn't want to drink it, because I know what happens to people who do drink of the wine of the rabbit. It doesn't work out well. It does not work out well, no.